Hello everyone. Welcome to Learning Python 101. This is going to be a one and a half hour course. In this course, we will be learning the basics of Python and a few of its libraries. Before diving in, let's do an introduction of Python. What is Python? Python is a general purpose, dynamic, high level integrated programming language famous for its Zen-like code. It's arguably the most popular language in the world because it's easy to learn yet practical for serious projects. It supports object-oriented programming approach to develop applications. It's commonly used to build server-side applications like web apps with the, the Django framework and is the language of choice for big data analysis and machine learning. Many students choose Python to start learning to code because of its emphasis on readability. Python is very simple but avoids the structure of C++ or Java which uses a lot of syntaxes like semicolons and brackets. Unlike C++ or Java, Python is simple and easy to learn yet it provides lots of high level data structures. Let's check out some areas where Python is used. Python is used in data science and data mining. Building different platform applications like desktop apps, web apps, mobile apps. It's also used in high level stuff like artificial intelligence, image processing, speech recognition and many more. Python has a lot of libraries which are utilized to build the things mentioned earlier. A few of Python's popular libraries are Django, Flask, CherryPy for web development. In terms of machine learning, it has PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, etc. To do some big data handling, Python has NumPy and Pandas. So, as you can see, Python is very popular and has a lot of opportunities. These are the major league companies that use Python in their system. As you can see, you land your dream job if any of these companies by just learning Python. It's also the most popular language by far. If you want to look at a glance in the salaries, well, here it is. On average, you can easily cross that 100k annually. So, what are you guys waiting for? Let's get started on learning Python with this crash course. Hello all, welcome to Learning Python 101. Today, we're going to install the Python module and an IDE to start our coding journey. Before learning to code, we need to install Python and an IDE on our system. So, in order to do that, we'll first install Python in our system. To do so, we go to our browser and click on the link shown in the video, which is this. This is basically the Python's main website where we will download the Python module for our system. As you can see, we will download from here and go to the Windows tab if you're on Windows. Now download the latest version, which is now 3.11.1. Going down, as you can see, there are different versions of it. If you are on Windows, you download it. If you are on 32-bit, you download the 32-bit one. If you are on 64-bit, you download the 64-bit one. I am on 64-bit, so I clicked on the 64-bit one. Now, since I already downloaded the file, I won't be downloading it, and I will just cancel the download in the background. Now, once I have downloaded the Python, we will need an IDE to code. So, there are many IDEs out there, but we are going to use the PyCharm. Also, use the link in the description to download it. The link is also shown in the video as well. This is the PyCharm IDE. As you can see, there are two versions, Professional and Community. We're going to work with the Community one as it's much easier. Plus, we're just starting off to code. Now, I've also downloaded the PyCharm in my system. So, I won't be showing you the full download here. But, you will have to download it. The file is a little bigger. So, be careful about it. After you've downloaded the Python module and the PyCharm, you'll have to install it in your system. To install it, just do it basically how you do it. And after you're done doing all of that, you'll move on to the next video. I will show you guys how to install it a little in the next two videos as well. Hello everyone. Welcome to Learning Python 101. It's a crash course to let you guys into the world of programming with the help of Python. Earlier, we saw what Python is, its uses and opportunities. Let's check out this course's roadmap or syllabus and then we'll get started on our journey. At first, we'll understand data types and variables. On the side, we will see commenting, keywords, operators. Secondly, we will see some containers which are basically variables that store a collection of data. After completing the third video, you guys will have learned about loops, conditional statements, and function. You will also know about global variable and local variables. Then, we will cover a new concept of programming known as object-oriented programming. In the error handling lecture, we will learn to handle exceptions and take inputs from our user. Finally, we will see to keep our data in a neat and clean way using CSV formats and files. We will also be seeing importing libraries where others or yourself have written some codes. With this knowledge, we will build a simple rock-paper-scissor game project. 
But wait, that's not all. This was only the basics of the course. We will also see some advanced topics. We will learn to create GUI or graphics to make the user communicate with us in a better way. We will also build a to-do list app with our GUI features. We will also manipulate data and graphs using Matplotlib and Pandas. Finally, to top it off, we will learn to collect lots and lots of data from the web and into our system through web strapping. Exciting, isn't it? If you guys stick to the end of this lecture, you will have understanding of how Python works and its usages, learn to code in Python, manipulate data with statistics and graphs, interact with users through graphical user interface, scrape websites for data and store them. Now that we know about our roadmap or syllabus, let's get on with our journey. Hello guys, welcome to Learning Python 101. This is the day where we will start our coding journey. Previously, we installed Python and PyCharm. Now, open up PyCharm and follow along with me to start coding. Once you open up PyCharm, you are going to be greeted with this window here. Now we are going to create a project. Go to the files and click on new project to create a new project. You can change the location by clicking here. Uh, for me, I am going to select the Python projects. Uh, never mind, I am just going to create a project on the dpass. And I'm going to give it a the name of the file. I'm going to keep it as test. You can change the name as you want. Give it the name you deserve and click on the create button. Once you do that, it's going to create a virtual environment and then update the Python interpreter. Now you're going to be created with all of this code. You can just remove them. You don't have to worry about them for now. If this method pops up, you can just cancel it. This is where you're going to code or we are going to code. Now you can change the settings and change its theme and other settings. This is where you can change the theme to light or dark if you want. I'm going to keep it on dark. Here you can change any settings. You can install any plugins if you want. Other settings can be changed. You can just change it to whatever you desire. Now let's move on a little bit. So here we are going to code. Here is the run button and the debug button. This is where the main interpreter starts the running code. Now I have one file so it's only going to run the main file but if you want to change to other file or if you have multiple files then you'll have to change it to the current file. Now if you are um, going to run a print hello world on our output console. Now after running this code if you just click on the run button then it will show the hello world on the console. Here I clicked it and as you can see the hello world is going to be printed. This is the output console and as you can see on the output console there's a hello world message. Now this is it for today. In the next video we're going to learn about data types and variables. Bye-bye for now.
In the last lecture, we learned about conditional statements. Here, we are going to check out loops in Python. Let's begin. So far in our code, we have done some tasks, right? What if we wanted to do some tasks over and over again? Say, I wanted to print the number 10 100 times. Am I going to write the same print statement 100 times? That would be really exhausting. Would you believe if I say that I can do this task in only a few lines of code? Well, to do that, we need the help of loops. Let's talk and look at the ways to loop and understand them better. Let's first look at while loop. The syntax of a while loop is here while is a keyword and follows it is a condition after which we see a colon and then the line of code that needs repeating. Now how do we know when to stop the loop? That's where the condition comes into play. The while loop will keep on executing the lines of code until the condition comes out to be false. Let's look at an example. Here i is initialized to 1. At first, the condition is checked if it is true or not. Since initially it is true, the code block of while is executed and i is incremented. Now i equals to 2. Again, the condition is checked and evaluates to true. Same goes on and finally, when i comes to 5, the condition fails and the loop breaks. Multiple conditions can be given by using logical AND or operators. Now, what if I wanted to break out of the loop at a certain stage? In that case, we use the break keyword. So in our loop, if we came across a certain condition, then we break out from that loop. Here we use an if statement. Firstly, i is printed twice, 1 and 2. After that, i equals to 3 and it satisfies the if condition inside the while loop body. Thus, we execute the code block of if. Inside it, we have a break keyword, which breaks the loop. After breaking the loop, if there are codes below the body of the loop, it gets executed as usual. The for loop is usually used on an iterable object such as a list or with the help of an inbuilt range function. The for statement in Python traverses through the elements of a series running the block of code each time. Syntax of for loop looks like this. On each iteration, the iter value is the parameter that gets the elements value within the iterable sequence. If an expression statement is present in a sequence, it is processed first. The iterating variable iter value is then allocated to the first element in the sequence. After that, the intended block is run. The statement block is performed until the whole sequence is completed and each element in the sequence is allocated to iter value. Let's look at an example of Python for loop. Now, let's look at another way of looping. What if you want to loop through a range of numbers? In that case, we use the range function. Now, I have been using the word function a lot. Don't worry, we will learn about functions very soon, but for now, let's understand what's happening. Here, we can see that we loop through the list using an index, as iterver contains the indexes of the list. But how did we do that? Let's dive a little deeper. Here, using the len function, we found the length of the list, and what the range function does is basically loops the iterver variable from 0 to 4. So when the print statements come, it basically does this, print my list of 0, print my list of one indexed element, print my list of two indexed elements, and so on. The range function can also loop through numbers. The range function basically indicates from starting point to the ending point without including the ending point. So write something like this evaluates the following. We can also skip steps inside a loop using the continue keyword. We can see that the number 3 is not printed. That's because when i is equal to 3, it goes inside the code block of if statement and carries out the continue keyword. Well, this is the end of this video. Hope you guys have a clear understanding of loops now. A small remember to practice the codes that we show here, as practice makes a man perfect. Goodbye and have a good one. Welcome back. Today we are going to learn about functions. Functions are like a block of code that only runs when it's called upon. We use functions when we want to do a task at different times. Now rather than writing the same block of code at different times, we write the block of code at a certain space and only once. So when we need it, we just call that block of code. We call this block of code a function. You can pass data known as parameters into a function. A function can return data as results as well. The function space looks like this. To call a function, we simply type in the function name followed by parentheses. Information can be passed into functions as arguments. Arguments are specified after the function name inside the parenthesis. You can add as many arguments as you want. 
just separate them with a comma. Now we have to call the function with the correct number of arguments or it will produce an error. Let's look at some code for a better understanding. Here we call the function and it printed a string. We passed hello as a string in the function. This a is a parameter that accepts the hello string. We can't call this function if you pass the wrong number of arguments. For example, these two codes will produce errors. If you do not know how many arguments that will be passed into your function, add an asterisk before the parameter name in the function name on the function definition, like this. You can also send arguments with the key value syntax. This way, the order of the arguments does not matter. This is known as keyword arguments. If you don't know how many keyword arguments you want to send, then use asterisk twice. Before the parameter name, we can also call a function without giving any parameter. We can also set an initial value to the parameter as such. If we don't pass any parameter on that function call, then the function will use the default value. For example, this one. As we can see, we called the function but didn't specify any values to country. Since there were no parameters passed, the function used the Norway string as a default. You can also send lists, tuples, dictionaries to a function as well. Before closing this lecture, let's look at the return statement and how a function returns a value or result. Here we pass the values 5 and 5. The function added those values which resulted in 10 and returned this result. So ultimately, when you call the function, it executed and evaluated to 10, which the print function found and printed it. One thing before we call it a day, as parameters, we can also send variables containing data. We will look at an example. What do you think the output will be? The output is 30, 5, and 10. Why? Let's find out. But first, we need to understand a little thing called variable scopes, mainly global variable and local variable. When we write variables in the main indentation, those variables are global variables. Their scope is the entire program. The data can be accessed from any part of the program. However, when you write when you create variables in an indentation, for example, when going in function or loop or if else blocks, they are known as local variables. Their scope is only within that block and they are destroyed after the indentation ends. Now back to our code. Firstly, if you notice that we have written a and b as parameters of the function and use the same name as variables later on. This is allowed because when we call that function, the parameters created local variables a and b. Inside the functional body, we work with these local variables. Now, local variables will get a higher priority than global variables. No, if we didn't pass any parameter and call the function normally, the body will work with the global variables. Try it out for yourself. Now, this was a big lecture. You guys should sit down and process everything. Watch the video again if everything is not fully cleared. In the next one, we will understand about a new way of programming known as object-oriented programming. So. We will see you in the next one. Hello all, welcome again to Learning Python 101. Today we are going to see a topic known as error handling and learn to take inputs from users. Now before we get to error handling, we need to know the difference between errors and exceptions. Errors are mistakes that the Python interpreter finds when interpreting your code, like for example a syntax error. However, exceptions are mistakes that are not found by the interpreter. It is something that you don't want in your program but has occurred at a certain time. For example, if the user has given unwanted inputs, the below code will give us a syntax error. However, the following code will pass the interpreter but will produce an exception. Now let's look at how to take in user input and then we will continue to understand error handling. To take inputs from users, we simply write a function called input. A function accepts user inputs as strings. We can also send a message in our console by writing a string inside the function. For example, this code here takes the input user as string. As we input a hello world, it outputted hello world as string. Okay, now back to error handling. So we have to understand the difference between errors and exceptions. Now that we have understood that, how do we deal with exceptions as it is something that might get thrown at us at any moment of time. For handling such cases, Python has provided us with a try except catch block. The syntax looks like this. Let's look at an example. Okay, now let's see an example. Here, as you can see, at the first line, I have declared a list. Inside them, I have Python, exceptions, try and accept. The indexes of these three items are 0, 1, and 2. 
However, inside the try block, I tried to print this list of elements through the range function with 0 to 3. Now there is no 3 index, so this will produce the exception. Now at the first, inside the try block, it will originally print the line 0 for file and 1 for exception and 2 and for try and except block. However, when the i became 3, it caught the exception and went to the except block and printed index out of range. Now this is how the try and else block except block works. So far we have seen exception messages on the console by the Python interpreter. But Python also provides us with the message of exception. But if you want to show a user defined message, then we use the raise keyword. Doing so, we will see the message in our console. Now let's learn about try else block. Python also supports the else clause, which should come after every except clause. Only when the try block fails to throw an exception, Python interpreter goes into the else block. Try block we basically try to do a task. If we fail, we go on to the accept block. But if we succeeded, we should accept the output. In order for us to accept the output, we will get the help of else block. Now this is a program for the try x else catch block. Inside it, first we defined it a function and pressed in the parameter number 1. Now inside the try block, we tried to divide 1 by the number with the variable stored in recipro. Then we have the except for the exception handling and finally the else block to print the recipro variable. At first, if it goes to the except block, then we'll print we cannot divide by 0 as I can divide 1 by 0. At first, we'd go with 2. When the number is 2, it divided and outputted 0 0.5. However, when I pass in 0, it says goes to the except block and says we cannot divide by 0. This is how the try else block works. Well, that was it for today. We only have one more video left to see some topics. Then we will move forward to our project. In the project, we will also use all the knowledge that we have learned so far and see a few new things and then use them to build it, the project. See you guys soon.
Welcome back guys. In this video, we're going to learn about CSV and importing libraries. Let's start. We have been coding in one python file. Now, if you have lots and lots of lines of code, then that one python file will get really messy. And if we have to review some old codes in the file, we will have to scroll up to see that and again scroll down to get to our current code. Rather than doing this, we can create multiple python files and import those files into one another. That way, we won't have to write many lines in a single python file and this way our codes will be neat and clean. Let's dive in deeper about this. What is a module? Consider a module to be the same as a code library, a file containing a set of functions you want to include in your application. The python developers have already written the backend of functions for us and all we have to do is use them. So far, if you remember, we have used them in lists, tuples, etc. There are lots and lots of functions which are not included in the main library, but rather in the other libraries. If we want to use those functions, then we would have to import these libraries. To do so, we would have to use the import keyword and then the library name. Let's look at an example to understand better. Now we are going to import a library. Inside the library, the python devs have already written codes in which we can use different functions to our needs. We don't have to write the codes for this because somebody has already done that for us and we can just reuse them. There are many more libraries, but we are going to show you a few of them. Here, as you can see, I have imported the datetime library and from the datetime library, I have called the datetime.now method. This is going to show the date and time of the current, which is this. Now, let's see another library known as the math library. Inside the math library, there are many functions, for example, the square root to get the square root of number, the seal method, the floor method. The math library also contains a few specific values of a constant such as pi's and others. Let's show you some code so you can understand better of how the importing libraries of math work. Here I've pasted the code of the square root method inside the math library. I square rooted the number 16 which is going to show me 4. As you can see it showed 4 in the output console. Now let's see other functions of the math library such as seal function and floor function. Now. In order to do that, I'm going to show you a code so you understand better on how the seal and floor works. Here, I've sealed the number 1.9 and floored the number 3.3. .3. So if I run it, okay, it ran, but I forgot to print the values of x and y. So to show you guys the values of x and y, I'm just going to write the statements print x and print y. Now if I run it, you're going to show 2 and 3 in the output console. 2 and 3. Now, let's see the values of a constant inside the math library. For example, what if I want to know the value of pi? So if I paste in the code of the math.py, see, I imported the math.py in x and printed it out. As you can see, it's 3.1415 blah 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 to specific decimal points. Now, now let's see another library. What about the random library? The random library in Python is used in many applications, which you will also be using in your project. So Let's see the in random library. I'm going to paste in the code for the random library. Okay, I have written it in another file. So if I run the code, as you can see, it outputted a random number. It's outputting random numbers at every time. Note that it's going to output the number between 1 to 1000, as I specifically pasted 1 to 1000. Now, as you can see, I have written the random dot random end. So I have to use the library name. What if I don't want to use the library name? Rather, I just want to use an alias name to shorten the library name. So if you want to do that, then you'll have to use the a as keyword. So the syntax is actually import random as rnd. This way, I don't have to write random every time, but rather I can just use the alias name, which is rnd. So if I print rnd.randomint, it's going to show me a new random number. Now, rather than using an alias name or any name at all, I'm just going to use the function name. In order to do that, I can import only the function from the library. To do that, I use from random import the function name. This way, I can just import the function that I'm using in my code from the library. Now, I don't have to use the alias name or the library name once and for all. So if I run the code, it's going to show me a new random number from 1 to 1000. Now, what if I don't want to use one function, but rather a lot of functions from the random library. In order to do that, from the random, import an asterisk. And 
asterisk means that it's going to import every function from the random library. So if I type in the asterisk now and run it, it's going to show a new random library. But now this just basically means that it imported every single function inside the random library. Now, so far we have been importing libraries and inside the libraries, the other Python developers have written the code. What if I want to import a file in of Python where I have written the code myself? In order to do that, I have to write the word import and rather than using the library name, I'm going to type in the file name. Here, I'm going to write in a code in the again.py file and import this file in the main.py. Inside the again py, I'm just going to write in a function called greeting. So let's type in diff greeting and inside the function, let me pass in a parameter known as name. Inside the function body, I'm going to say print the name parameter, a simple function, nothing too fancy. Now if I want to use this greeting function in the main python file, all I have to do is import this again python file. So I will have to now I'm going to type in imprt import again a g a i n. And now if I want to use the greeting method, all I have to do is call the function with the library name again dot greeting and let's pass in the parameter as it accepts the parameter. Let's pass in let's say bishal b i s h a l bishal. Now if I run the program, you'll see bishal in the output console. See, we shall in output console. Now, as you can see, the greeting function is in again.py file, not in the main py file. But I, have, I can use this greeting function from the again.py as I import it again as a library. You can do this to reduce code in a single Python file. Congratulations, you have completed the basics of learning Python 101. This has been a great journey for us so far. To celebrate this milestone, you can look at a project, which we will show next. You could try to code that project yourself and if you are stuck, then don't feel shy to watch us. You are always welcomed here and if your thirst for knowledge is still there, then embrace yourself and join our advanced learning Python crash course. For now, good morning, night, noon, afternoon, wherever you guys are and goodbye. Hello again. We have completed the basics of learning Python. So congratulations on that. Let's build a project with the recent knowledge that we have acquired. Before going into the project, let's see a little topic known as typecasting. Typecasting basically means to cast from one data type to another. Here inside the integer with parenthesis, the one is in string, but covering it with integer makes it an integer data type. Also, the same goes for z. If you want to type cast to string, then cover the number with str keyword, like line number 3. Let's make a rock paper scissors game. It's very simple, so I hope you guys can do it. Try to code it yourself, and if you get stuck, then watch the video. Let's walk through our code. As you can see, this is our little project's code. Let's do a walkthrough so you can understand. Firstly, we imported the random library. Then, we created a function called play. Now, what's inside the function is we passed two parameters known as player score and CPU score. Inside it, we did an infinite loop which is while equals to true. Now, we will break out of the loop but we'll see that condition later on. Inside here, we used a list of strings, which is rock, paper, scissors, and end. And these choices index are 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, here, computer is a variable where I use the random libraries, random int function, with the parameters 0 and 2. This is going to return me a random number between 0 to 2. Why did we do this? Well, this is where we choose the computer to which turn he wants or which round he wants to do. The 0 is for rock, the 1 is for paper and 2 is for scissors. After the computer has chosen, now it's time to the player or the time for the player to choose. As you can see, I created 3 print statements, rock, 1 for rock, 2 for paper and 3 for scissors. Finally, the 4 for ending the game. Here, I have used the input function to take the input from the user. Now I typecasted the string to any integer and reduced 1 so I matched the list indexing. Now this condition basically checks if the user has given some incorrect input then the loop will just continue and I will print out the choose proper values. Once the input has been chosen to a proper value, the player will choose from this list of items the proper string. If the player has chosen 4, the end string will be assigned to the player. 
Now here I check if it's not n, which means if, if it was n, I would just end the break loop and break out of the game. But if it's not n, that means I print out two statements to see what the player has chosen and what the computer has chosen. Now the way I've printed this is called an f string. Here basically with the way you write the string is simple with double quotes notation. But at the first I have clicked an f. By this way I can print out the variables data inside the string notations. As you can see this sorry as you can see the player is a variable and I want to print the player's data as well as with this sentence. That's why I use curly braces and cover the variable inside it. This way if I print it it will say you chose with the what the player variable contains. Now if the player and computer has the same round or the same options they chose then you will just basically print out a tie. However if rock and if the computer chooses paper that means the user lost. If it's the other way around that means the user won. If the user wins, I increase the score of the user by 1. If the user lost, then I increase the score of the CPU by 1. The same goes for all the other conditions. Finally, if I see that the player has chosen the end string, then I print out the game is finished with the final scores, and I print out the final score using the F string as well. Finally, I break out the loop, so the game has been ended. To start the game, I call the function by passing the 0, 0 which basically means the initial value of the score is 0, 0. Now let's run the file and see how it's working. Here as you can see, 1 for rock, 2 for paper, 3 for scissors, and 4 to end the game. If I choose incorrect values, it will print out that I chose proper value. So if I choose rock, as you can see, I have chosen rock. The computer generated with the random function is paper. As paper covers rock, I lost. Now if I click on 2, it will choose paper. As you can see, I chose paper, but with the random function, computer chose rock. Which means that the paper covers rock and I win. Again, let me just remind you that here the random function is generally a random number between 0 to 2. And with the list notation, it's setting an integer number which is 0, 1, or 2. So randomly, I just choose the from this list of numbers either the choice of 0, 1, or 2. Now, if I want to end the game, I just click on 4. See, the game is finished and the scores that we kept in the score and super score is being printed up. LCP is 1, there is 1. Well, that was it for our project distribution or the project goal of project explanation. Now, if you have succeeded in making this project, then a big hand for you guys. But if you fail to do so, then no problem, you will get better over time. Congratulations on completing this basic course. Let's move on to the advanced part of Python. See you guys in that version. Hope you guys will stick around with us. Bye bye for now. Hello everyone. Welcome to the advanced section of Learning Python 101. In this course, we will be seeing matplotlib, tkinter, and web scrapping. These are a bit advanced topics of Python, so I hope you have learned all the basics and understood them from our previous lectures. If you have then, let's move forward. First, let's understand what is a GUI. GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. It is a desktop app which helps us to interact with our computers. In our project, we interacted with the console, which wasn't very fun to do. All the apps that you run and use all have a user interface, but our little project didn't, which was a little boring. So let's learn about GUI and add it in our small project. GUI contains lots and lots of features like adding buttons, images, slides, combo box, canvas, etc. Although we can't show all of them, but we will see some of these neat features. There are many GUI libraries in Python like Kiwi, Python Qt, WS Python, Tkinter, etc. Tkinter is easiest to start with. Tkinter is Python's standard GUI package. It is the most commonly used toolkit for GUI programming in Python. In order for us to get started, write the following codes. Here, we imported the Tkinter module, then created a window and gave it a title called GUI. We printed a message on the screen. Also, do you know what the last line does? Well, the main loop function basically does an infinite loop. Why? Because the tkinter screen appears and disappears. So if you run the code without that line, then it will basically disappear within a second. So that line basically loops the appearance and disappearance of the screen infinitely. But it's so fast that you don't notice it. Now I'm going to show you a little more about importing libraries. Write the following code. Notice that now we didn't write the word tkinter every time. 
That is because of the first line. The first line indicates that from the tkinter module import everything. We can also import a part of the module by writing like this. For now, we will be importing everything in the tkinter module. Also, everything we will add, we need to add before the window.main loop line, as this line basically tells the Python to render everything before it. The window is an object and is of class tkinter. The message is shown through a method called label, which accepted two parameters. The first one is the tkinter object and the second one is a string. See, we are using object-oriented programming to code, so you must have a good understanding of object-oriented programming. Now inside our main window, we can add many widgets and make it an actual user interface. Now, what are widgets? A widget is an element of a GUI that displays information or provides a specific way for a user to interact with the application. We will be showing you a few widgets that are available in Tkinter. Labels are used to view text in the window. Here. We created a label class object that will show hello on the screen. The font parameter we were able to give the text size, style and font. Also notice that the font accepts value as a tuple. Now the grid is a function that helps us to put elements or objects in the desired positions of the screen. These functions are called geometry functions. We can set the default window size using the geometry function and shape it to our needs using the function. There are also other functions like pack and place. The grid function breaks the screen into a grid of rows and columns. Some prefer to use the place function as it breaks the screen into a 2D point of x and y vectors. We will also be using the place function. Now, buttons. Here we created a button that has a text called enter. The BG stands for background color and FG stands for foreground color which means the text color of the button. Now as we know, when we click a button, it does a task for us. But here, clicking the button does nothing. So let's code and give this button a task. What we are going to do is bind this button, button to a function. When the button is gonna get clicked, the function will be called. In the code, we define the window as a tkinter object and its size of 500 by 500. Then we created a button and placed it in the middle. Finally, when we click it, we call the clicked function. The clicked function is the function that was bound to the button. To bind a function to a button, we simply pass a parameter when creating the button with a command keyword and function name. When the clicked function was called, it displayed the text. Well, this is it for this lecture. We'll continue in the next one. Goodbye. Welcome back to the graphical user interface video. In this video, we're going to learn more about widgets. Let's start. Entry. Entry class is used to take inputs from users, which makes the screen interact with us. It accepts everything as string. As you can see here, the E is an entry object. The text that we write inside it is displayed on the label. The text is accepted as a string, and to get the text, we call the .get method. Spinbox. Spinbox is used as a counter. It provides the range of values to the user, out of which the user can select the one single value. It is used in the case where a user is given some fixed number of values to choose from. The message box module is used to display the message boxes in the Python applications. There are various functions which are used to display the relevant messages depending upon the application requirements. The syntax to use the message box is The function name represents an appropriate message box function. Title is a string which is shown as the title of the message box. The message is a string to be displayed as a message and options. There are various options which you can choose to configure this message dialog box. There are much more such as warning, error, confirm message box, etc. List box. It is used to add a list in our screen. We use the insert function to insert items in the list box. Scroll bars. It's used to add a scroll bar which helps us to scroll through a list of objects. In the code, we added it with the pack geometry function. We placed it in the screen. The side parameter tells it where to place the bar while the fill both means that it will fill the blank space in both the directions that are x and y. With the list box we can only scroll vertical and set it to scroll bar. Finally with the command in the config we view vertically the list. Photo image. Photo image is used to view photos on the screen. A photo is rendered with the help of a label. Photo image class accepts only GIF, PNG, PGM and PPM files. This basic syntax is. Now let's look at events. 
We know that a mouse has three buttons, the left, right and middle mouse button. We can bind each click to a function. Let's see the code here. btn is our button. Let's see an example. If you have noticed, the functions accepted a parameter known as events. That's because a click in Tkinter is known as events. So when you click right, the function call goes to right click, for left it goes to left click and finally for middle it goes to middle. Now that we have learned so many widgets, let's apply them and build a small application. Here is the task for you. Build a very basic to-do list app. Now if you get stuck, don't feel shy to watch us code it. You guys are always welcomed here. Let's begin with a small application. Firstly, we will be importing the necessary modules, then we will create a window so that we can place widgets on it. Well. This is it for this lecture, we will continue in the next one. Goodbye. Welcome back guys. Here we are going to see our project's code and explain the code to you. So what are we waiting for? Let's start. WS is used to initialize TK. From now, WS will be called as the parent window. All other widgets will be placed on it. WS.geometry is going to take parameters with height, x, width plus the x position and the y position. All the values provided must be integers. Then we set the title. We use config to provide a background color. Resourceable accepts boolean values. Since boolean values are provided false for both height and width, that means the window can be resized. Ws.main loop holds the screen so that we can see the window. Now in this section we will understand why we have used frames as a first widget in our code. Frame widgets are used to hold other widgets. They help in keeping and maintaining user interface and user experience clean and organized. Pad Y equals to 10 means we have added extra padding around the frame from outside. Adding a list box. In this section we will learn why and how we have used list box on the windows. LB is the variable name for storing list box. Width means horizontal space provided is 25. Height is 8 rows in the vertical position are provided. Highlight thickness is equals to 0. That means every time the focus is moved to any item, then it should not show any movement that is value 0 is provided. By default, it has some value. Select background, it decides the color of the focused item in the list box. Active style is none, which means it removes the underline that appears when the item is selected or focused. Geometry manager we use here is pack. Side equals to left, this will keep the list box to the left side of the frame. We did this on purpose so that we can assign the right position to scroll bars. This will fill the blank space in both the directions that are x and y, fill equals to both. Now we create a list where we will store our data. At first it is empty. The lb.insert in comma item. This command stacks the items in list box. lb is a variable used for list box. Insert is a built-in method of list box to insert the data. N signifies that a new item will be added in the end. If end is replaced with zero, then new data will be added at the top. Item is the list item from task list. In this section, we will understand why and how scroll bars are added to the window. Scroll bars are used so that the users can scroll the information that is placed in a limited size on the window. And these scroll bars are placed on a frame and the variable assigned is SB. The geometry method used here is pack so that every time remains dynamic in a sequence. Size is equal to right, so we have placed the scrollers on the right side of the frame. We provided a size to left for the list box. Now fill goes to both, this will fill the blank space in both the direction of x and y. The lb.config with y scroll command equals to z.set. What does this mean? Well here, we have assigned a purpose to the scroll bar. In other words, we have bind the list box with the scroll bar. Now, what does the last line do? Well, here Y view means scroll bar will go in the vertical direction. If it would have been X view, then the scroll bar would have worked in the horizontal direction. Now let's add an entry box so it is used to take inputs from the user. Finally, we have used another frame for buttons. Buttons are placed to trigger some action, right? Well, here we have created two buttons, add task and delete task. Both of them have the same features and look except the background color and command. When the button is clicked, the function mentioned in command is called. In this case, if the user clicks on add task button, then new task function is called. And when user clicks on the delete task button, the, then the delete task function is called. Let's see these functions. Um, for new task function, in this function, we have stored the value of the entry box and the task variable get method is used to pull the value provided by the user in the entry box. If this condition is applied to avoid black blank space 
entry in the list box. If the task does not have any blank space, then only it will allow it to store the information in the list box. Otherwise, it will display a warning message informing the user that entry box can't be empty. Now let's check delete task function. Here anchor refers to the selected item in the list box. LB is the variable assigned to the list box. A delete is a built-in function to delete the list box item. User will select the item in the list box and then to trigger this function, he or she will click on the delete task button. Immediately the item will disappear from the list box. Now we know all the logic behind our simple project. That is it for today. In the next video, we will also be seeing a little bit of math and statistics programs and libraries called Matplotlib. Also, we will be seeing how to handle big time data with CSV files and help from finders libraries. Bye bye for now. Welcome back again to Learning Python 101 Advanced Course. Today, we are going to be seeing Matplotlib and pandas. Let's get going. Matplotlib is a low level graph plotting library in Python that serves as a visualization utility. It is open source and we can use it freely. Pandas on the other hand is a library that is used to open large dataset files. It is much easier to handle these files with the help of pandas. Let's look at a few methods of pandas. Pandas is a python library used for working with the datasets. It has functions for analyzing, cleaning, exploring and manipulating data. Why use pandas? Pandas allows us to analyze big data and make conclusions based on statistical theories. Pandas can clean messy datasets and make them readable and relevant. Relevant data is very important in data science. Pandas give you answers about the data like is there a correlation between two or more columns? What is the average value? Max value, minimum value. Pandas are also able to delete rows that are not relevant or contain wrong values like empty or null values. This is called cleaning the data. In this course, we are going to use pandas to read and write CSV file. To install pandas, just write this code in the CMD, pip install pandas. Now let's follow the code. Here we imported the pandas library with the alias name pd. Then we created a dictionary. Pandas create data frame on the basis of key value format, where keys are column titles and values are corresponding rows of data. It's best to use the dictionary type to create pandas data frame. In the code, my dataset is the dictionary with keys, car, and passings as strings. Their values are less. After that, we convert this dictionary into a pandas data frame object, finally printing it to the console. Now we can also create a CSV file in our folder. In order to do that, just write this line before the print statement. The to CSV method will convert the object into a CSV file with the title myvar.csv. Now, if we want to read the CSV file, then follow the code. Here we import the pandas library and use it by the alias pd. We create a pandas data frame object df and inside it we read the csv file with the read csv method. Finally printed it out. We can access rows with the help of a lock function or loc function which basically stands for location. This will print the first location. We can also give index names just write the dot to csv function with a parameter like this one. Let's see another example. As we can see, we gave column names by passing a list in the index parameter. We can also access a single column with the location function and giving the column name as index in the list just like this one. Now let's move on to matplotlib. To install matplotlib, simply write the command in the cmd pip install matplotlib. Now onto the coding part. Most of the stuff here are going to show in the project or pyplot submodule of matplotlib. So we will import that with the n alias name also. We will need the help of numpy. Now what is numpy? Numpy is a python library that works on list data types. It converts list to array which is faster and can do more operations than list. But the array still acts like a list with more operations. So don't worry too much and let's jump into matplotlib. By the way, we also have to install numpy so do that as well. To do that, just write pip install numpy. Now treat numpy or the numpy modules as a list and we will be good to go. Let's look at this code. Here we imported the libraries, then x points was a list of values but that is converted to numpy array for better usage and y points with the same method. 
Then we plot the graph with x axis as x points and y axis as y points. Finally, we showed the graph using the show method. This graph shows a simple straight line. Well, this is it for this lecture. We'll continue in the next one. Goodbye. Welcome to the extension of Matplotlib. Today we're going to see scatter plot, bar plot, and pie charts. Let's start. Let's look at a bar plot as a start. The plot dot bar is what creates the bar graph that may takes two values of type array or list as x-axis and y-axis. The show method displays the bar on the screen. If you want to show the bar in horizontal order, then replace the bar method with the bar h. h stands for horizontal. Duh. To set the color of the bar, pass in a color parameter, like this one. We can also change the width by passing width as a parameter. Now let's look at scatter plot. With pipe plot, you can use the scatter function to draw a scatter plot. The scatter function plots one dot for each observation. It needs two arrays of the same length, one for the values of the x-axis and one for the values of the y-axis. For example, let's look at this code. This will produce this as an up output. The observation in the example above is the result of 13 cars passing by. The x-axis shows how old the car is, while the y-axis shows the speed of the car when it passes. Are there any relationship between the observations? It seems that the newer car, the faster it drives, but that could be a coincidence. After all, we only registered 13 cars. See, Matplotlib helps us in statistical analysis by drawing these graphs. Let's look at another way. Colors. You can set your own color for each scatter plot with the color or the C argument. Let's look at this code. This code basically changes the color of each dot, as you can see. We can also make each dot in different color as well. To do that, follow this code. This will produce this output, and as you can see, each dot has its own unique color. You can change the size of the dots with the S argument. Just like colors, make sure the array for sizes has the same length as the arrays for x, y, and y axis. You can also adjust the transparency of the dots with the alpha argument. Just like colors, make sure the array for sizes has the same length as the arrays for the x axis and y axis, as it is plotting a dot based on the x axis and the y axis coordinates. So keep maintaining that. Now set your own size for the markers with the help of this code. You can combine these properties to get the desired scatter plot. Let's now look at a pie chart and then end this video. With pie plot, you can use the pie function to draw the pie chart. I am now I am showing all of this, but I am assuming you guys already know what's the pie chart and what's the bar chart, what's the scatter plot. Now back to the course. As you can see, the pie chart draws one piece for each value in the array. In this case, it's 35, 25, 25, and 15. By default, the plotting for the first wedge starts from the x-axis and moves counterclockwise. The size of each wedge is determined by the comparing the value with all other values by using this formula, the value divided by the sum of other values. We can also add labels to the pie chart with the label parameter. The label parameter must be an array with one label for each wedge, like this one. As we mentioned here, the default start angle is the x-axis, but we can also change the start angle by specifying a start angle parameter. The start angle parameter is defined with an angle in degrees. Default degree is 0. Start with the first wedge at 90 degrees. This is the graph that you're going to find if you follow this code. Now, maybe you want to one of the wedges to stand out. The explore parameter allows you to do that. The explore parameter is specified and not none must be an array with one value for each wedge. Each value represents how far from the center each wedge is displayed. Pull the apple switch 0.2 from the center of the pie. The code we are showing is will produce the following output. We can also set the set of colors of each wedge with a colors parameter. The colors parameter is specified must also be an array with one value for each wedge. Now look carefully that each of these arrays are basically lists, but why are we working with arrays? Because NumPy arrays are much faster than lists. So don't feel anywhere that we are using NumPy array. They are just basically lists, but what works much, much faster. Now we can also add a legend. The legend will tell the user or the one that is showing the graph will help them to guide them. To add a header to the legend, add the title parameter to the legend function. Well, that was it for this video. Hope you guys have learned really well what Matplotlib and Pandas is. See you again soon in the next video where we will teach you 
how to scrap from the internet or the topic web scrapping. Hello everyone, today is going to be the last lecture of this Learning Python 101 Advanced Crash Course series. Congratulations on coming this far. Let's look at our last lecture which is going to be about web scrapping. What is web scrapping? Web scrapping, also called as web data mining or web harvesting, is the process of constructing an agent which can extract, parse, download, and organize useful information from the web automatically. In other words, we can say that instead of manually saving the data from websites, the web scrapping software will automatically load and extract data from multiple websites as per our requirement. The steps involved in web scrapping are Step 1 is downloading contents from the web pages. In this step, a web scrapper will download the requested contents from multiple web pages. Step 2 is extracting data. The data on websites is HTML and mostly unstructured. Hence, in this step, web scrapper will parse and extract structured data from the downloaded contents. Step 3 is storing the data. Here, a web scrapper will store and save the extracted data in any of the formats like CSV, JSON, or in a database. There are many libraries to do web scrapping in Python such as Pattern, Scrappy, Mechanize, Beautiful Soup, Request, etc. In this tutorial, we will be seeing Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup does not come pre-installed with the Python package, so you will have to install it in your system. To do so, go to the CMD and type pip install beautiful soup 4 and hit enter. After that, you can also install some third-party parsers like HTML5Lib or LXML. To do so, type this command separately and hit enter each time. These are called parsers, which parse the HTML documents so that Python can read them. Beautiful Soup also supports Python's default HTML parser. Now, firstly, let's import the libraries and that we need in our journey. Now, let's follow through a code to understand how to scrape data from the web with the help of Beautiful Soup. After importing the libraries, what we have to do is select a website. Here, I have already selected a small website. Then, with the help of requests, we establish a connection to the server and the request library will make a GET request to a connection and the web server, which will download the HTML contents of a given page for us. With the print function, we are able to print the HTML elements of the website. Now, printing it like this is a little messy. To make it simple and a little bit more understandable, what we will do is turn this content into a soup object which, with our beautiful soup that can read it. To do that, we need to use a parser. Here, the page.content gets parsed with a default parser, then into a soup object. With the predefined method, we were able to format the text and now it's easier to navigate. Now in the HTML, there are lots and lots of tags in which we have the information that we need. Here in the sample website, we see a head tag containing the title of the website and a p tag that has a paragraph. We can get this information. First. We need to find the tags in which we have the information. Here it is in a p tag. So to find the elements, we will use the find all method. This will return a list. Here there is only one p tag, so the list has one element. Notice that the tag is still inside the list. As we know how to access list elements individually, we will access this list the same way. The first index is zero, and to get the text inside the p tag, we will use the method dot get text. Now, in the output, we see the text inside the paragraph tab. We can also find only one tag with the help of find method. If there are multiple tags when we use the find function, then it will return the first tag it finds. Now, in the HTML, there are lots and lots of div tags. And to differentiate from these divs, there are class and ID tags. Mainly, when we scrape data, we search through this class and ID to find the info we desire. Let's see how to browse the HTML doc with classes and IDs. If you look at the right, we have displayed an HTML. Here in the div section, we have two classes, class names and an ID. We can enter these tags through this class. How can we do that? The method we are going to be using is the find all method. If we remove the p tag, then it will search the whole doc and find all the tags that contains this class name. We can also search by ID like this. Again, this will return a list and we can access individual items in the list. Also, with the getText method, we will get the information. We can also search by CSS selectors. To do so, we will use the method dot select. Well, this is it for this lecture. We will continue in the next one. Goodbye.
Welcome back to the web scrapping tutorial. Today we're going to code a project or a scrapping project if you prefer. Let's start. We know a lot about web scrapping and its functionality. Let's scrape from a live website and store the data in a CSV file. The website we're going to be scrapping from is the 7 days forecast. This one. We will also be storing this data in a CSV file with the help of pandas. Let's get coding, shall we? Firstly, we'll import the necessary libraries which are beautiful soup and request. We will also import pandas as it is needed to turn the data into a CSV file. We connect to the page with the help of request.get method. Then make the page's content into a soup object with the help of HTML parser. Now as we can see, we want to scrape the weather information for 7 days. Here through inspecting the website, we see that the list of this information is in a UL tag with the class name 7 day forecast list. So we search by this class tag. Under it, we see that the list of elements are in the tombstone container class. Now this is the first. To get all these list elements, we will use the find all method. First, let's scrape the first day's information. To do that, it is in the first element of the list. So we get the first element, then find by the class name for period and get its text. Do the same for description and temperature. Since we can do it for a single data, then we can do it for all the list items. To make life a little bit easier, we will use the CSS selector method and get the list items quickly in a list. Now we traverse the list with the for loop and create another list. In this list, we will get the text. Notice that we used an unusual form of for loop. Here it basically means that T will traverse through the list made by the CSS selector and each time it will call the t.getText method which will keep on entering inside the periods and other list variables. This way we don't have to write much code and it will be clean and clear. Finally, the list will be converted into a pandas data frame with column names of period, short description, descriptions and temperatures. This data frame is in the form of a dictionary. To create the CSV file, we call the toCSV method. Well, that was it for today. Congratulations on completing this course. I hope you guys have learned a lot from this course. There is still a lot to learn about Python, but completing this course will give you an edge in learning them and you will be one step ahead than the rest. Good luck, you guys on your coding journey. Have a great one. Good night. Hello everyone, for the last time. Don't worry, this isn't a lecture video. It's just a small thank you note and congratulations speech on completing this course. So, congratulations on completing the entire course. Hope you guys have learned a lot from here. If anything wasn't clear, then do watch the videos again so you can understand better. Also, a big thank you note from us for sticking with us at the very end. Let's see what you have learned so far. Data types and variables, containers, conditional and loop and functions, object oriented programming, error handling, libraries. We also built a rock, paper, scissor project and tkinter and use the GUI to build to-do list project. We also saw Matplotlib and Pandas and finally web scrapping. Wow, so many topics we covered in our course in such little time. That was a real roller coaster. However, a little sad note, the learning journey is not over yet. There is still a lot to learn. If you want, you can still learn even more details on the topics we covered here as well. Now, let's see the full iceberg of learning Python. Go to the link and check it out for yourself. There are so many mysteries yet to uncover. So this is actually the beginning of your journey. Hope you guys will power through that roadmap and land on your dream job. Speaking of jobs, let's see the future of Python and its opportunities. Python is buzzing everywhere. From the career perspective, also the future looks very promising for Python. Over 40,000 jobs are completely reserved for experienced Python software developers worldwide. It has some Things to work on in the future, they include speed, compatibility with native environments, runtime errors, browser integrations, etc. These things can cause problems while writing code in Python, but the benefits more than outweigh the weaknesses and make Python one of the most popular programming languages. Adding to this, Python is also used in data analytics, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other revolutionary technologies. It is expected to get more importance in the near future. So undoubtedly, Python has the ability to help software developers to make their future bright if they can work and use it properly. Also, it tops the list of most used and most favorite program languages in the world. So Python is looking real hot, isn't it? Let's see the market. 
An average Python developer in the US earns from $150,000 to $260,000 annually. Now that is a lot of money. This is only the developing side. There's still machine learning, web devs, data analytics, and much more. So what are you guys waiting for? Get on the train and goodbye and good luck on your journey.